Uh, I'm very happy to have uh, Francesca Molinari from the economics department at uh, Cornell University. Uh, Francesca has done a lot of important work, both in uh, theoretical and applied econometrics. And today she will be talking to us about uh, identification analysis with uh, set value predictions. Thank you so much, Francesca. And uh, yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, including this work in this uh, very interesting conference. I should say that uh, what I'm going to talk about is in part based on work that I've done a while ago with uh, Ilya Molchanov and Daria Berstiano. And uh, the reasoning to talk to you about things that we've published a while ago is that there is a lot of scope, I think, for um, benefiting from this community. And so I want to talk to you about what are the problems that economists think about within this uh, class of models and what are open questions where I'm pretty sure that we would benefit from input from this group. So first, I just want to very quickly um, get on with the same language in terms of what do, what, what do we mean by identification analysis. And this actually is, a, I think, a good segue to the previous uh, presentation. So what we want to do here is to learn features of the relationship between some variables y, x, and epsilon. And to make it concrete, and uh, in light of the example that I'm going to use as my working example throughout, think of the y, the outcome variable, as a vector of players' actions. Enter the market, don't enter the market. Think of x as a vector of payoff shifters, which have the property that the econometrician, the researcher, can observe these payoff shifters. And think of epsilon as a vector of not observable payoff shifters. Usually economists think about fixed costs or, that, or other features of the cost function of firms that uh, the, the researcher cannot observe. All firms observe these uh, features epsilon, but the researcher does not. And what we want to do is to learn the payoff function. And in particular, often the interest of the researcher is, into, is in learning the interaction effect. So what's the effect on the um, profits, on the payoffs of player one due to the presence or absence in the market of player two, okay? What do we observe as researcher? The only thing that we observe is data on Y and X, the outcomes of the game and the uh, observable payoff shifters. And from observing this data, we can learn their joint distribution P0. What we're going to do is to posit restrictions on the data generating process from which, which has determined Y, X, and Epsilon. And again, to go back to my entry game example, for example, I'm going to assume that the observed outcome of the game results from static simultaneous move mesh play. That's a restriction on behavior. I'm going to assume that I know the functional form of the payoffs uh, of the players. So that this uh, is a function which I know up to some finite dimensional vector theta one. And I'm gonna assume that the distribution of the unobservable payoff shifters is also known up to some other vector theta two, okay? And what I want to do is to learn theta one and theta two and, and possibly feature of the joint distribution of the unobservables. I'm gonna denote by capital theta the parameter space where the parameter vector theta lies and by theta zero, the true data generating value. That's the thing I want to learn as a researcher. I'm gonna assume throughout, uh, for most of this talk that my model is correctly specified so that all these assumptions that I'm making about behavior and so on are correct. And then what I want to do, the key question of identification analysis is what can be learned about theta from the observed data and the maintained assumptions. Okay. Now, historically, uh, and most traditionally, identification analysis has always has focused on what I'm going to refer to as complete models. And what are complete models? These are models where given a value of X, Epsilon and Theta, the model tells you uniquely what's the value of the outcome, okay? And, and I, I, will give, I will come back to an example to, to uh, make this concrete when I um, go to my entry game example. And so in models which are complete, because for a given value of Y, X and Epsilon, there is a uniquely predicted value for the outcomes, as an implication of this, I'm also going to have a unique model implied distribution of Y and X associated with each possible value of theta in the parameter space, okay? And we say that the model is point identified so that the parameters theta can be recovered 
if you wish, from the observation of the joint distribution of y and x, if whenever I take a value of theta, which is different from the two, true data generating value theta zero, the distribution of y and x implied by the model when I plug this candidate value theta into the model is different from the distribution of y and x implied by the model when I plug the true data generating value theta zero. And of course, if the model is correctly specified, the distribution of the data implied under theta zero by the model is equal to the distribution of y and x that I see in the data, okay? So now, how am I going to deviate in this talk from uh, these basic ideas is that more recently and, and more specifically in connection with the topic of this conference, identification analysis has been studying models which are incomplete. Meaning these are models where when you give me a value of the observable payoff shifters and observable payoff shifters and the parameter vector theta, the model returns to me a set of values for the outcome variable of interest. The example that we're gonna look at is an example of a two-player entry game. And the reason why I'm going to get a, value, a set of values for the outcome variable is because the, this class of models has uh, multiple equilibria. And the multiple equilibria give me the, um, the multiplicity of prediction for uh, the outcome of the game. Because there are multiple outcomes of the game that are predicted, there are as a consequence also multiple distributions for y and x, for the joint distribution of y and x given by the model, okay? And so in this case, we cannot obtain point identification of uh, the true value theta zero, but we can still learn something quite useful about theta zero, which is a set of observational equivalent parameter vectors. That set of observational equivalent parameter vectors is what I'm going to refer to as the sharp identification region for theta zero, which I'm going to denote by capital theta with a subscript I to indicate that this is what can be learned about theta in this class of models. And what is going to be um, this set? This set is going to be comprised of parameters theta such that when you plug them into the model, you obtain a joint distribution for y and x which matches the one that you observe in the data. If we, you quickly compare with the definition of point identification, the difference here, the definition is based on the same idea of equating P of Y comma X under theta with the P zero of Y comma X, except that in the case of point identification, the set theta is a singleton. But when you have models which are incomplete, the set, the set theta is uh, generically not going to be a single term. And so then the goals of uh, partial identification analysis are to provide computationally tractable characterization for this set of uh, observational equivalent parameter vectors and to provide tools for statistical inference on this set of parameter vectors. I will attempt to draw a connection with the previous talk. Um, if you think about what was discussed in the previous talk, when the index of whichever was the profession that gives the highest um, wages and therefore is selected is not observed, the previous talk concluded by saying that, well, ident identifiability may not be possible. So the standard point identification literature would say, okay, let me think really hard and try to find a sufficient set of restrictions on the model that will still allow me to say that there is a unique value theta zero. And it will, allow you, it will allow me to uniquely pin down this value theta zero. The problem that we try to face here is that sometimes this additional restriction that we need to impose to shrink this set theta i to be a singleton are assumptions that are non-testable. They're assumptions which don't come from uh, the underlying theory behind the model or from, in, in, in our case, from economic theory. And so we want to avoid these assumptions altogether. And so we want to say, okay, if I, don't, if I cannot make credible assumptions or assumptions that are testable, can I still learn something useful about the parameter vector theta? And the answer is typically yes. And how can I characterize in a way that is computationally tractable this set of observational equivalent parameters? And once I have a characterization, how can I actually uh, put, start, put confidence intervals, test hypotheses and so on in this context? And what I would say is that I think we have come down with uh, 
pretty good computationally tractable characterization of theta i in the sense of being able to um, say whether a specific, we can easily say whether a specific theta belongs to theta i by solving a convex program, as I will show you in this, uh, in this talk. But the question of how to trace out the entire set theta i in a computationally good way is a completely open, well, not, there are some uh, proposals in the literature, but none is fully satisfactory of how to fully trace out this set in cases when this set is not convex, okay? So this is one of the open questions here. Okay, so before I jump into the details, let me, uh, try to give you a list, non-exhaustive list of examples with which I would like to argue to you that models with set valued predictions are actually quite common. So the first model that I have here on my list is the entry game with multiple equilibria. That's the one I'm gonna focus in this talk 100%. But network formation models also belong to uh, the set of the, the collection of models which are set valued predictions and so do certain type of auctions. And this is, and these first three are models where you have um, interaction between agents. And then there is a very, very long list of single agent models where also set valued predictions arise. Okay. So what I'm going to do here is to talk to you about the two player entry game. And first I'm going to explain why there is an identification problem. And then I'm gonna talk about partial identification we, when we allow for mixed strategy equilibria and some uh, easier partial identification when we restrict to pure strategy equilibria only. And if by any chance I have time, I'm also gonna talk to you about how to carry out statistical inference in this class of models based on a new work in progress that uh, I'm doing with um, only get BU, Hiro Kaido. And, and otherwise, if, if I'm running out of time, I will have to skip this. And then I'm going to conclude. Okay, so um, by the way, feel free to ask questions if anything is unclear. It's a bit, uh, it's a little bit extra challenging to talk to an audience because I cannot see anybody's face naturally. Uh, I just see the big room, but please feel free to interrupt me. So the working example that I'm going to use here is that of a simple two-player entry game where um, each player makes zero profit has a zero payoff if they stay out of the market. They make monopolist pay, uh, they, they make monopolist profits if they enter alone. And they make duopolist profits if they enter together with their opponent where these delta one and delta two parameters are the interaction effects and they're assumed to be negative. So duopolist profits as opposed to monopolist profits. The distribution of epsilon, which I'm going to denote by F here, is going to be assumed to be known up to parameter, uh, parameter vector rho. So in this case, it's just a, a scalar, which is the correlation between epsilon one and epsilon two. The researcher wants to learn uh, the vector of uh, payoff parameters, beta one, beta two, delta one, delta two, and the correlation between the errors. So for example, the correlation between the fixed costs of the two players. And what the researcher observes is the vector of uh, observable payoffs and the vector of realized equilibrium outcomes of the game. Now, uh, the way that these uh, equilibrium outcomes of the game connect to the model is that if we assume pure strategies only, then these uh, realized outcomes are elements of the set of equilibria. And if instead we allow for mixed strategies, then the realized outcomes are just a random mix and draw from one of the equilibrium strategy profiles. So in terms of notation, I'm going to denote by sigma j, the probability that player j enters the market. And I'm going to abuse notation a little bit and use the same notation uh, uh, fractor u to denote the expected payoff associated with strategy sigma. In terms of behavioral, behavioral restrictions, my key assumptions are going to be that the observed outcome of the game results from static uh, simultaneous move Nash play and that players have complete information. Um, I can drop complete information and make this uh, incomplete information problem. I'll talk a little bit about different solution concepts later. And then I'm going to assume that the observable data identifies the joint distribution of Y1, Y2, X1, X2. For example, this would be the case 
if I observe players um, play the same game across markets, think about airlines, and think, think about airlines deciding whether to enter a market or not, and define a market as a city pair, then I observe uh, airlines' decisions to enter different markets across, let's say, the United States. And from seeing these airline decisions across the United States, I can identify and eventually estimate the joint distribution of the decisions and of the observable payoff shifters. And F here, as I said before, is the joint distribution of the unobservable payoff shifters. Think of those as fixed cost. And I'm going to assume that this distribution is continuous and known up to uh, the correlation parameter rho. And I'm going to rely on mixed strategy, Nash equilibrium and solution concept. And that, but as I will discuss later, all that follows generalizes to most or perhaps all solution concepts. I put all here with a question mark because I'm always concerned that maybe there is some solution concept that I don't know about. I will later, after I've put down some more notation, I will tell you what are the crucial ingredients that the solution concept has to satisfy for all of this material that I'm gonna show you to apply. So from the perspective of uh, an econometrician, how should we think about, how does one represent um, the mixed strategy Nash equilibria here? On this graph, I'm putting the, the fixed cost that the econometrician does not observe on the axis here. And what's going to happen is that depending on the realization of the fixed costs relative, relative to uh, the observable up to theta part of the payoff shifters, which is the x1, beta1, x2, beta2, and the deltas, relative to that, if the epsilons realize sufficiently high, then this, uh, so up here, then this model is going to have a unique mixed strategy Nash equilibrium which is degenerate and both players enter with probability one. If the epsilons realize sufficiently low down here, then there is also going to be a unique equilibrium where both players enter with probability zero. In the dotted region, player one enters with probability zero, player two enters with probability one, the opposite in the uh, vertical line region. And the essence of the problem and the essence of the fact that we have set valued predictions here occurs in the center, where in the center, what happens is that we have uh, three mixed strategy equilibria. Two are again degenerate and one is a totally mixed equilibrium. So because the model predicts multiple mixed strategy Nash equilibria, then the model also has a set of potential outcomes. Again, in the, region of multiple, of, uh, in the regions where there is a unique equilibrium, the predicted outcome is unique. For example, up here, the, there is a unique predicted outcome where both players enter. But in the region of multiplicity, all four outcomes of the game are possible. So we can have that no player enter, both players enter, or only one of the two players enter. So in this, this is the sense in which the model has set valued predictions. And any solution concept for which, which is going to deliver um, a correspondence, a set of equilibria that satisfies a certain measurability property that I'm gonna show you later, is going to be uh, a solution concept with which I can apply all of the, all of the results in, uh, in this talk. Okay, so now what I want to do next is to formalize the notion of model incompleteness and then move on to explain why there is an identification problem. So first I'm just here going to write the standard definition of the set of mixed strategy Nash equilibria. So it's going to be the collection of strategies so that uh, um, each player plays the best response. In our working example, this set of mixed strategy Nash equilibria is going to have either one or three elements. When epsilon realizes such that there are three mixed strategy Nash equilibria, then the model is incomplete. Why is the model incomplete? Because we don't know how the equilibrium that we observe played in the market has been picked. So we only observe outcomes of the game and we don't know whether those outcomes of the game result from the totally mixed equilibrium or from the uh, pure strategy equilibrium, okay? So what is the way, what is missing 
from the model for us to have the standard complete model, which has been in the past studied in the econometrics literature. What is missing is a selection mechanism, a rule that would tell us how to pick an equilibrium with, to be played in the multiplicity region. And so uh, in general, a selection mechanism would need to satisfy two key restrictions. It has to assign a non-negative probability to each of the mixed strategies, which are equilibrium, and it has to sum up to one. The problem that we face is that this mixed, this uh, selection mechanism is completely unknown and may depend on both X and epsilon. And what this selection mechanism does in practice is that it builds all possible mixtures of model predictions. So let me go back to my picture here for a moment. And before I talk about all what's written in other parts of this slide, let me focus here and let me try to first give you an intuition for why we have an identification problem here. Imagine that you are a, uh, imagine that you face this problem and you observe outcomes of the game. And your first instinct is that you will go and you will estimate the parameters of the payoff function by solving a maximum likelihood problem. What do we do when we write a likelihood function? What we do is that we say, okay, if I observe the outcome one, one, that means that epsilon has to have taken uh, realization in a, certain, uh, in a certain subset of R2 here, okay? But the problem is that because I have the multiplicity of equilibria, when I observe one, one, I don't know whether epsilon has realized here or whether epsilon has realized here and I'm observing the outcome of a totally mixed equilibrium, okay? So I could say, okay, well, I'm going to say that it could have come from both, either the gray region or the red region. And that's what's, what's going to be the probability of, uh, of uh, observing one one is going to be the sum of the gray region and the red region. And that's going to be the piece which goes into likelihood for that. The problem is that the same is true when you think about zero, zero. The probability of observing zero, zero can come from, so the, the event where you observe zero, zero comes both from the event where epsilon realizes in the green region, but also can come from the event where epsilon realizes in the red region and the totally mixed equilibrium which picks zero, zero occurs. So now you could say, well, if you were to think I'm also gonna apply this entire region to the model implied probability of zero, zero, now you, would already, you already see that you will have a problem because you will have a likelihood that does not integrate to one. And that is why you need the selection mechanism because you need a way to sort of cut the pie where the pie here is the red region between a piece which goes to zero, zero, a piece which goes to one, one, piece that goes to zero, one, and a piece which goes to zero, zero, to, to the other one. I forgot which one I had not listed yet. Okay, so Let's think in a more systematic way, what is the relationship for a fixed selection mechanism R and a fixed parameter vector theta? How can I figure out what the model predicts as uh, the probability of the various outcomes of the game? So for example, if you look at the probability that the model assigns to one one as outcome of the game, that probability is going to be the probability that the model assigns to the gray area, which here I'm calling F of gray, because F is the joint distribution of the epsilons. And, and here I'm just trying to uh, use a shorthand to indicate um, that epsilon has realized above this level, and epsilon two has realized above this level, and epsilon one has realized above this level, giving us this gray region. But then there is gonna be another possible place from which the outcome one one can come, which is going to be uh, the event where epsilon has realized in the red region, the selection mechanism selects the totally mixed equilibrium and the totally mixed equilibrium happens to give us a one one. And so I need to take this uh, product of probabilities here, and then I need to integrate it against the distribution of epsilon 
over the right area. Okay. Similarly, I can say, well, now what's the probability according to the model that the outcome zero one will occur? Well, it's going to be the probability that epsilon realizes in the yellow region. So this part up here, where zero one is the unique equilibrium of the game. <clears throat> Plus, I then need to worry about the region of multiplicity. And in the region of multiplicity, zero one could come out in two ways. It could be because the totally mixed equilibrium has been selected and zero one happens to be uh, the outcome of the, of the game in that case, or the degenerate equilibrium that assigns probability one to zero one is selected, in which case uh, that's the only probability that I need to put here. And then I need to integrate it out with respect to the distribution of epsilon. Now, the reason why point identification will fail here is because I can find multiple values of theta and multiple ways to divide the region of multiplicity through the selection mechanism R, so that when I plug this selection mechanism R into the model and I plug this value of theta into the model, I'm going to exactly match the distribution of outcomes of the game that I see in the data, okay? So I'm going to exactly find myself in a situation where I can take two different values of theta plug them into the model, use two different criteria to complete the model and still match the distribution of the data, okay? Questions? Okay. Uh, uh, hi. So one clarification question, uh, because I don't remember all the notation, so sigma yeah. once in the mixed region, sigma, the mixed equilibrium, does it depend on the thetas and the epsilons and the x's? Like it does. This? It, right. it okay. depends so, on, uh, it yeah. depends on, uh, so if uh, um, the sigma one star would be, oh, let me see my own notation for a second. <laughs> It's gonna be, I think, minus x2, beta 2, minus delta 2, over epsilon 2. And this is, the other one is gonna be the opposite way. Because it has to be the one that makes it different between the two actions. Right. So it will, the, the short of it, whether I wrote correctly the, the expression here or not, uh, I think I did, but the short, maybe the, the yeah. Uh, the short of it is that, yes, it depends on all the parameters and it depends on the epsilon. And that's part of what makes it more difficult than in the case of pure strategy, but I'll get back to that um, when, I, when I go through simplifications. So I guess then, I mean, uh, so I guess the integrals that are there, R should take as input delta as well, or uh, uh, so, the, and then like kind of like I mean, okay, so maybe the notation. So the, so 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 the notation is implicit because yeah. these expressions for the sigma one star and sigma two star they get too big to put on the slide, yeah. but that's right. So the the let me perhaps instead of focusing on the specific uh, expression here, which I may also have gotten wrong, let me just say that this is sigma one star is a function of the entire x vector uh, and the entire theta vector oh, and the epsilon. Actually, let me write it like this. It's so this is a more compact way and also probably less uh, uh, written to me having put the typo there, yes. Other questions? So one thing that I want to emphasize here is that conceptually, you could define this sharp identification region. So what you could ask yourself, okay, I understand this idea that there are different ways in which I can cut this region of multiplicity. And as I consider all the possible conceivable ways to cut the region of multiplicity, I'm going to collect all the values of theta which are associated with a specific cut, because once you decide how to cut the region of multiplicity, you, can you have a well-defined likelihood function. So you could literally imagine that you're gonna take a selection mechanism, 
first select your mechanism and you're going to write the likelihood function associated with the selection mechanism, maximize the likelihood, obtain theta. And then you're gonna do it again for a different selection mechanism. And then again, for a different selection mechanism and so on and so forth. And by doing that for all the possible selection mechanisms, which are completely unrestricted probability distributions that only need to satisfy these two conditions. If you could do that, that would give you the sharp identification region. What does that mean? That every parameter theta in that region, so every parameter for which you can find a selection mechanism such that this condition here is satisfied is a parameter that is consistent with the observed data and maintained assumptions. So it's parameter that is consistent with the data generating process and the data that you see. And so collecting all those values exhausts the information in the data and in the assumptions and that's what you really want to obtain. However, in practice, this probability distribution, this selection mechanism is a nasty object to work with because we call it an infinite dimensional nuisance parameter because it depends on X and epsilon and we don't have, and can depend on theta. We don't have any, um, we don't want to take a stand on what this selection mechanism is. And if we don't take a stand on what this selection mechanism is, um, it becomes an object that in a, even in a statistical or in a computational sense is hard to work with. And part of what I want to show you today, actually the main thing that I want to show you today is that there are tools in the toolkit provided by mathematics that basically allows us to not have to worry about this selection mechanism at all. So to bypass it so that we don't need to compute to do computations related to it. But before I go there, I want to show you an example of, you could say, well, okay, there, is going, there are different possible selection mechanisms, but surely there are more reasonable selection mechanisms than others. So if I were to restrict myself to the reasonable selection mechanism, would it actually matter which one I pick at the end of the day? So what I want to show you is a table from a paper in Econometrica by Steve Barry, 1992 paper. So a paper that was written when there was no, not, no work on this idea of partial identification. People were going for complete models. And what he was studying was the entry in the airline industry. So he wanted to understand the competition between Delta and United and so on, all the airlines. There were many more airlines in the, in the United States in 1992. And um, um, so he, I'm not gonna get into the details of that paper, but one of the things he did is that he, he, he one of the things he did was to look at maximum likelihood estimates when under two distinct selection mechanisms. One was that the most profitable firm moves first, and the other one was that the incumbent moves first. And one could argue that both are very reasonable selection mechanisms. And on some parameters, um, like for example, the, um, this one here, it didn't make too much of a difference which selection mechanism you picked. But for example, on a parameter such, that, such as the distance between um, the cities covered by the airline, so the city pair that constitutes a market, so whether you enter in that market or not, in this case, we see that the sign on the parameter flips and these are statistically, so in parentheses here, you have uh, standard error. So these are statistically significantly different uh, um, estimates. The effect of, the popula of population size on whether firm enters or not the market has a size which is like three and a half times as large. And the other, so another thing which is interesting here is that the correlation parameter takes a dramatically different value in the two cases. And so what I'm trying to convey to you by showing you this table, which was based on estimates in unsuspecting time when nobody thought about partial identification is that it actually can make a lot of difference which selection mechanism you use. And these are two selection mechanisms which are arguably both very plausible, okay? So let me tell you with this long introduction, let me tell you what we actually do to deal with this problem. So the, our key idea is to avoid altogether to use, to, to work with this infinite dimensional nuisance parameter, which is the selection mechanism. And we do that by leveraging the theory of random sets. The idea here is actually intuitively very simple. The idea is the following. 
the model predicts a set, a set of outcomes. There is a lot of work in mathematics that give us probability distribution, notion of expected value and so on for sets. So why don't we go and use the tools for what our model predicts? And hopefully by doing so, we can use do standard econometrics in a way that is easier. That was the idea. And so um, I'm going to jump directly here to my definition of a random closed set, just to, because this, the reason why I want to show you the formal definition is just because it's going to feed back to the idea of which kind of uh, solution concepts can I allow for. We have that, you know, starting, so we, we are going to define all our random variables on some probability space, omega fracture F and P, which I'm going to take to be non-atomic just because it simplifies things and usually in economics, we always have some underlying random variable that has a continuous distribution. So the, the, the probability space is non-atomic. Um, and I'm going to denote by calligraphic F, the collection of closed subsets of RD. And I'm gonna say that the map bold X, bold capital X here is a random closed set. If for every set K, the pre-image of this set K belongs to the sigma algebra. So what's the pre-image of the set K is going to be the elements of the sample space such that um, the realization of the set capital X associated with this element of the sample space intersected with, in, intersected with this uh, uh, set K is non-empty. So let's try to step back from this abstract uh, definition when we have a random variable, we have that the random variable associates with each element of the, of the sample space, um, an element of R or RD if it's a random vector. And the pre-image of that random variable has to belong to the sigma algebra for, the, for, 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 the, for, for that to be a random variable, so for it to be measurable. And here there is just a different notion of pre-image, which is basically based on tracing out which the events of uh, which elements the set X hits. And if you, uh, and by looking at all the events where the set X hits any set K, you're actually in fact going to be able to trace out the entire distribution of the set X. So the point is that in terms of solution concepts, what we show in the paper, but I'm not gonna show formally today, is that if capital X is the set of mixed strategy Nash equilibria, then in fact, it's not hard to show, actually it's easy to show that uh, that set of mixed strategy, that set of mixed strategy Nash equilibria satisfies this uh, measurability condition. And so if you want to use a different solution concept like pure strategy Nash equilibrium or uh, Bayesian correlated equilibrium or uh, Bayesian Nash equilibrium, rationality of level K, whichever, you, what one needs to do is to verify that this condition is satisfied so that you have measurability. If that's the case, then you can apply the, the set of tools that I'm gonna show you next. So once you have a random set, uh, the idea, one key role is going to be played by the selections of the random closed set. So one of the people who contributed a lot to this literature was Bob, is Bob Bauman and the way that uh, he always he describes random sets is that you can think of random sets as a bundle of random variables, and so this, the selections are the bundle of are the random variables that belong to this bundle. Okay, so we say that lowercase x is a selection of uh, capital X if lowercase x belongs to capital X with probability one. And so here is just a simple graphical depiction of what uh, a random set X could be, where this random set X actually is an interval, right? And this interval just takes different realizations across different elements of the sample space. And little x has to be a random variable that lies inside this interval with probability one. And so as I look at the interval across values of omega, I get this tube, this irregular tube that I plotted here. Now, an important remark for later is that, in fact, each, each selection of the random set can be built using, that, using a possible selection mechanism from the notation that I showed you before. This capital R, this probability distribution, could in fact be used to give you a rule to pick 
this little x here, okay? Questions? Okay. So then what I want to do is now, well, now that I've defined the random set and its selections, I actually want to define the expected value of a random set. And, and the reason is because defining this expected value of the random set will allow me to leverage many results that then I will go back to my identification problem and close the circle for how it is all related, okay? So I'm gonna say that uh, this random set X is integrable if it possesses at least one integrable selection. And I'm gonna say that it's integrably bounded if all its selections are integrable, basically. And just to keep it in mind, if we think about the set of mixed strategy Nash equilibria, that set of mixed strategy Nash equilibria, the elements of that set are a, are a subset of the, of the unit square. And therefore, all the selections of the set of mixed strategy Nash equilibria are going to be integrable, okay? And so then I can define the notion of expectation for a random plus set to be what? Again, so this is uh, called the Alman or selection expectation. And the idea is that a random set is a bundle of random variables. You pick out of this, uh, of this box of random variables, the ones which are integrable. You compute their standard expectation and you put them in a new basket that you're gonna call the Alman expectation. That's literally what's going on here, okay? The result that is going to be useful for our identification analysis is the following. If you have a set X, a random closed set X, which is integrable and is defined on a non-atomic probability space, then the Alman expectation of this set is going to be a closed convex set. And in, part and in particular, the Alman expectation of that set is going to be equal to the Alman expectation of the convex cell of that set. And what's really important for what I'm gonna show you next is this last property that the support function of this Alman expectation in direction U is actually equal to the standard expected value of the support function of the set X. This ability to pass the Alman expectation inside, um, sorry, to take it outside of the set and put it out here is what's going to give us all the computational tractability. So again, the result is the following, that if you take you, the support function of the Alman expectation is equal to the expected value of the support function of the set. And I'll come back to this result when I, in the next slide, I reconnect it to our identification problem so that I will be able to tell you why this result is so useful but for now, I'm just gonna ask you to keep it in mind that this, this result here will come back. Okay, so I've finished my little detour on uh, random set theory. So natural question is, okay, how does that help me with the identification problem that, that was described before? Here is how it, it's all gonna work. Do the following photo experiment. Fix the value of calligraphic theta and fix a value of X and epsilon. And now consider, so take a selection from the set of mixed strategy Nash equilibria. So take a specific equilibrium. Now that specific equilibrium is going to imply a probability distribution of reaction profiles, right? So zero, zero is gonna occur with probability one minus sigma one times one minus sigma two, one zero with probability sigma one times one minus sigma two, et cetera. Now, Collect all these distributions for all values of, for all the selections of S theta into a new set, which I'm gonna call capital W theta, which itself again is gonna be a function of X and epsilon, where this capital W of sigma is going to be given by all these vectors across the possible values of sigma in the set of mixed strategy Nash equilibrium, okay? As I mentioned before, it's easy to show that these sets S theta and W theta satisfy the measurability condition that defines a random closed set. Now, before moving on, let's reflect for a moment. What is the set capital W theta? 
the set capital W theta actually collects all model implied conditional distributions for the outcomes of the game given X and epsilon. So if you fix a value of X and epsilon, you condition on a value of X and epsilon, then you ask yourself, what are the possible probability distributions of Y implied by this model? Well, you know that once you fix X and epsilon, the only randomness left is associated with the, with the mixing, okay? And so the probability that uh, zero, zero we realize is one minus sigma one times one minus sigma two, and so on and so forth. But the model does not give you a single sigma one, sigma two pair that is a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. The model gives you multiple. Um, in our case, it gives you at most three, right? In the simple example that we're considering so far. So we have three of those, okay? Those are the first apparent ones, but then we also have to remember that there are all the possible mixtures of these three equilibria, right? Because at the end of the day, we can mix across them. And so in this set, W calligraphic uh, W theta, we are going to collect not only the conditional distributions of Y given X and epsilon associated with the free mix strategy equilibria that I put in the picture before, but also all their mixtures, okay? Now, this is a conditional distribution given a uh, conditioning on both X and epsilon, but of course, when we do statistical inference, we need to get rid of the unobservables, right? We always average out the unobservable. And that's where the Allman expectation comes in to play an important role. Because now what we're going to do is we're gonna take the conditional Allman expectation of this set W theta by basically taking uh, all the selections of the set S theta and then computing the conditional expectation of the vector little w associated with that selection sigma conditional on X. Now this set, this conditional Allman expectation is a set that exists and is unique. This was not proven by us, but it's one of the results in the random set theory. But what is shown by us is that this set here is the set of all model implied conditional distributions of Y given X. Again, there is a strong connection with the idea of selection mechanism that I spoke to you about before, because what one can show is that this Allman expectation, in fact, collects all uh, the probability distributions as I had shown in this, uh, as derived, for example, here, it's going to collect all these type of vectors of this form across all possible selection mechanisms R, where again, these selection mechanisms can depend on X, epsilon, and theta, okay? That's what it's going to do. This Allman expectation collects all such vectors. And now you could ask, oh, now you could ask, well, how does that help me? Why does it help me to think in terms of this set if you're gonna bring me back to talk to me about the selection mechanism that you before said is hard to work with? The reason why it's helpful is because to compute the actual Allman expectation, I would need to work with the selection mechanism, but to compute the support function of the set W theta, I don't need to do that because the support function of the set W theta is simply the support function of a free element set in my example. The set W theta includes uh, the probability distributions associated with at most three equilibria, the two, total, the two degenerate ones and the totally mixed equilibrium. So we're gonna compute the support function of this three point set, and then we're gonna integrate out epsilon by taking the expected value. And so computing the support function of the Allman expectation is actually very easy. While computing the Allman expectation itself up here would be very difficult because it would require me to go through the use of the selection mechanism. Okay. Questions? Okay. So now, to close the loop of how do I characterize this uh, sharp identification region theta i, 
I'm going to denote by as a shorthand P0 of Y given X, the vector in this simple case, the four by one vector of the probability of each of the possible outcomes of the game in this, uh, in this case. And now, if the model is correctly specified, meaning players play mixed strategy and equilibrium, and my utility, the payoff functions are correctly specified and so on, and the true value of theta that generated the data, it has to be that the distribution of the outcomes of the game that I see in the data belongs to this Aumann expectation. Why? Because the Aumann expectation collects all the probability distributions over outcomes of the game implied by the model. And if the game, if the model is correctly specified, the distribution of outcomes that I observe in the data has to be an element of the, is an element of this Aumann expectation. And so then to define my identification region, I simply need to check what, are, what is going to be the set of values of theta that are observationally equivalent. It's going to be the ones for which I cannot separate this convex set from this point. And that problem is a problem that is easy to solve through convex optimization because it's basically just a separating hyperplane problem. And so what's going to be the set of parameters theta that are observationally equivalent? They're going to be the ones such that the support function of this uh, singleton P0 of Y given X is dominated by the support function of the Aumann expectation, which as I mentioned before, is just equal to the expected value of the support function of the set W theta. And so trying to summarize this in pictures in terms of what is entailed here to do, the idea is going to be that I'm going to first obtain the set of mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. Each element of the set of mixed strategy Nash equilibria is going to imply a probability distribution over outcome profiles for this game. And I'm going to take this set W theta, which as you can see here, just contains three elements. And I'm going to compute the support function of this set. And now the support function of this set in the regions of uniqueness is just going to, if you compare this set W theta, now what you do is you're just gonna say, what's the maximum um, over W in W theta of U transpose W, right? So in this, uh, in this uh, region of uniqueness here, that inner product is just going to, for example, pick out the fourth element of the vector U, and that's what I get here. And in the region of multiplicity, I'm taking the maximum between the inner product of the direction vector U with three elements. And so it's going to be the maximum between U2, U3, and the product with the totally mixed equilibrium. So this is just a nonlinear function of epsilon, which then I'm gonna integrate out with respect to the distribution of epsilon. And uh, the support function, so the, the support function here is, uh, um, the, the resulting problem here is going to be concave. And so I can solve this problem through a convex optimization. Questions? Okay, so um, as I mentioned before, the approach that I just uh, explained can be applied to many different solution concepts, correlated equilibrium, base correlated equilibrium, rationality of level K are just a few examples. As I said, presumably any other solution concept subject to the requirement that uh, the set of equilibria which is implied has to satisfy the measurability condition that I showed you before. Computationally, what's, what, what's to do here is the part about verification of whether candidate calligraphic theta belongs to theta i, I think that that problem we have solved satisfactorily because we can just solve that problem through convex optimization. Uh, in fact, in certain cases, it's just gonna be a linear program. However, tracing out the entire set theta i can be quite hard because there is no reason to believe in general that the set theta i is convex. 
So sometimes the set guitar looks something like this. And so tracing it out in an efficient way is something that we don't know enough about how to do it. Was there a question? Okay. Yeah. Is it easy to do the convex hull of the identified set easily or not even, not even that? So that is something that I, so, okay. Excellent question. Um, I've, two parts. There are, uh, I thought a little bit about that specific question. So something that we did do is that, for example, sometimes in, in practical applications, we don't necessarily care about uh, um, the entire set, but we care about its projections because, for example, you want to know whether, um, say, imagine that I had drawn this uh, picture, these lines well, so that they were actually the projections. Maybe what you care about is simply whether um, the interaction effects are within us. You, you, you care, for example, only about the interaction effects. And so you just want to have a, an interval of values for the effect of firm one and firm two and vice versa for the other. And so there, what, what I've tried in my own work is to use uh, Bayesian, method, Bayesian optimization methods to solve this uh, non-convex optimization problem. The other thing of, I thought of doing was uh, convexifying um, the moment inequalities that result here. So if you look at this expression here, these are what we would call moment inequalities because this could be written analogously as U transpose P0 minus this Alman expectation. I'm just gonna write it like this, less or equal than zero. So what I thought that maybe one could try to do was to convexify this, uh, sorry, convexify this as a function of theta. And then, uh, so I think that by, if you convexify this, you would get the convex cell of the set. But, but then I thought that the convexification exercise itself is computationally very costly. So my concern was that I'm just moving the place where, where there is the bottleneck, if that's what you had in mind here. Okay. Be because I mean, yeah. Sorry, uh, yeah. So another question is, so there is dimensionality in the theta part of vector, like uh, anyways, the, the coefficient vector. There's also like this example here talks about two firms. So I was wondering mm -hmm. like your convex optimization approach, like if I have, you know, you know, K firms, right? So like, is there an exponential explosion? Like, cause like, you know, now the outcomes are like two to the, two to the K possible outcomes. Two to are the gonna, K, yeah. Are you, gonna, are you gonna pay for that in the algorithm? The two to the K? So, um... So my, the, what, what, the convex optimization problem has two to the K variables because the size of the U vector is the same as the size of the outcome space. What is my concern, my bigger concern is that uh, computing the set of equilibria becomes increasingly hard if I have more firms, for example. So I view that as a separate problem. Uh, I view that as a, mm -hmm. a, a... So if I were, for example, to stick with pure strategy Nash equilibrium, then I know that, in fact, my convex optimization problem boils down to a linear programming problem. And so in that case, I'm not really too worried. I'm not terribly worried about uh, uh, the dimension of the U set or the number of constraints, even though the number of constraints is gonna grow uh, quickly, but because it's a linear program, I think it's okay. 
Again, I, I'm not a computer scientist, so maybe I'm missing. So my, my thinking that it's okay is uh, misguided. But what I think is more problematic is that the more firms I have, the harder is. I think it seems to me that the, the first bottleneck is how do I compute all the set of equilibrium? Because an additional advantage of this toy example that I showed you is that, in fact, I know exactly what's the Nash correspondence, whether it's in mixed strategies or in pure strategies. But in more complex games, what the economists do is that we simulate the game, which I'm also not sure if it's the best thing that one can do. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's a, I guess, a, an array of questions that one can pose. For example, you know, like maybe you have like K K firms, but you know, like in your observational data, you see up to five of them participating at any time, and like now, do you have to pay this two to the K, even though you only see I don't know K to five at most or whatever? Like you know, like there's I guess the, uh, uh, an, uh, yeah, a set of questions to ask, but yeah. I mean, I guess it's open-ended, so I'm just curious about your thoughts overall, but we can take it off, off, offline as well. Yeah, yeah. So my concern with what you are just saying is that if it's literally only five firms are uh, playing, I have, uh, or are in my data, I have a different problem, which is that uh, that setup that you just proposed calls into question my assumption that uh, from the data, I can learn the joint distribution of Y and X, right? because it's not clear that I can really learn the distribution of Y, of the entire vector Y of K, uh, you know, the action of uh, the distribution of actions of K firms or, or the distribution of outcomes of K firms, if only some of them actually play, right? So that's an additional concern, which, I, which in some sense is separate from this identification question. Uh, okay. okay. Yes, yeah, thank you, yeah. Yeah, thanks. So um, I think I have like zero minutes. Is that an accurate statement? Yes, kind of. Okay. Then uh, I will have to skip the simplification for pure strategies. Let me just tell you my uh, main takeaways and the summary. So my, the main takeaway here is the following. Models with strategic behavior often deliver these set-valued predictions. That is true for uh, finite games, it's true for uh, auctions, it's true for networks, and, uh, network formation problems. And the presence of these set-valued predictions creates difficulties for point identification. Intuitively, the reason is because you can find these multiple pairs of selection mechanisms and model parameters that are going to deliver the same distribution of the observed variables. Um, while selection mechanisms are a perfectly fine way to think about the problem and to conceptualize it in your mind, they create practical issues because they're infinite dimensional nuisance parameters. And so if possible, it's better to avoid them. And our proposal here is to use these tools from uh, random set theory as a natural toolkit because they give us this uh, expectations for all the selections of the model predictions that then we can connect to the support function. Uh, I skipped the part about pure strategies only, but there are also nice simplifications related to uh, characterizations of the distributions of all the selections of model predictions, again, through simple inequalities. And so the reason why this is helpful is because it allows us to determine if a specific calligraphic theta belongs to theta i through a convex program that sometimes is even linear. But as I mentioned, one of the big open questions is that I can easily determine whether a specific calligraphic theta belongs to theta i, but then because theta i is not convex, I, I, I do face a problem after that, which is how do I efficiently characterize the entire theta i? And even if I care only about projections of theta i, what's the best way to compute these projections? We, we have a paper that provides a way to do that, but we are econometricians. We are not uh, people who do, you know. <laughs> there are people who know how to do this better than us, and I would certainly be very interested to, to, to get ideas and suggestions about this. Thank you. Any questions? We have some questions already, but any discussions? Uh, maybe actually I have a question. Yeah. 
So uh, I have a question. So in, in all your uh, your examples, uh, early on you had this assumption of the atomless distribution, uh, mm -hmm. which I guess it's it's natural in in, in many uh, economic contexts. Uh, how important this assumption? What if I have something that's more like discrete, which is more closer to a computer science kind of uh, way of thinking? Uh, do these results carry over or partially or which? And if um, the problem is that if you have a, um, if you have a atomic structure, then the atomicity structure is going to have an impact on what the expectation looks like. That's, that's the main idea. So let me try to keep it simple. And if not, I can add the page here and, and, and scribble something. Uh, it's a little bit like with random variables. So in a, the random variables were discrete random variables and continuous random variables. So if the atomicity is here, if, if, if we have atomicity, then the Hellman expectation is going to end up being like... Uh, the expected value of a discrete random variable. So it's literally going to be um, the you know, probability of the, of the realization. Imagine that you have a sample space which has uh, three atoms. So then it's going to be uh, the realization of the random set associated with the first atom multiplied by the probability of that atom plus the second plus the third. So now what's going to be lost is the convexity result. So, and, and, the, and, the, and the loss of the convexity result is going to, um, so then the results that I've showed you would apply to the convex hull of the, of the set of equilibria. Without, without the atomicity, the convex hull of the, the expected, the Alman expectation of the convex hull of the set of equilibria equals the Alman expectation of the free equilibria. But without the uh, but with atomicity, it's it's literally like you know it's a superset of it. Does that answer your question? I guess yes. Uh, so in the case where my set of uh, so so can I, sorry can I can I add a small point? Yes, please. Uh, so what does it imply? What it implies is that. Something that we really care about or we cared about at the time of thinking about this work was to uh, come up with a methodology so that we would get this sharp identification region. So the sharpness was really important to us that all the thetas that we give you through this characterization are thetas that are consistent with the data and the assumptions. Now, if I work with the, with, if the convex hull of the, of the set of equilibria, the expected value of the convex hull is not equal to the expected value of the set of equilibria itself, which happens in the case of atomicity, then the set of parameter values that I'm going to give you is a superset of the sharp identification region, which means that I'm leaving information on the table. So I'm not using all the information in the data and in the model, I'm giving you too many parameter values Based on the data and the model, I could figure out that there are less parameter values. Thank you. Uh, that, did, did that make sense? Yes, that makes sense, actually. Thank you, Marion. Okay, good. Uh, any, any last questions from the audience? Okay, if not, we're gonna thank uh, Francesca again. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. <laughs>